letter to the Philippians, chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul is just sending a greeting to his uh, friends and brethren in Philippi. Um, he started the church there uh, on his one of his missionary journeys, uh, and he's continuously thankful for their partnership, and that means how they assisted each other. Paul didn't just assist them and teach them and train them. Uh, he also received support, financial support, as he did uh, continued to travel around the region and spread the gospel. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So, who is this one who began the work in them? He says, Paul says, I am confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. To me, that's obviously God. God is the one who began a work in them. That God is the one who was doing the work through them. And people really, a lot of people don't like that idea that God's the one who works through us. They like to take credit for the work that they're doing themselves so that they can present some kind of glorious work to God as if it can affect their salvation. But anything that happens, any good thing that happens, you can give God the credit for it because God does it through you. And uh, the day of Christ Jesus, uh, I'm not settled on what this is. I know there are a bunch of options. Uh, I mean, for me, sometimes this could be used in a sense of whenever we die. Because that whenever we die, I would die on a different day than you. And each day would be the day that we meet Jesus. Uh, it could be 70 A.D., Went at the destruction of Jerusalem when Christ came and destroyed the Jewish way of life and confirmed the Christian kingdom uh, for all time. Or it could be some specific day in all of our futures in which uh, we are judged by Jesus. And that's what I used to think. But now I see a lot of options. So it really doesn't matter. Uh, because that day has either already come or will come, and there's nothing you can do about it. So it has, should have no effect on the way you live your life. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I find it interesting how Paul gives God credit for everything. And when he uses the word grace, he uses it to cover everything. Uh, he's not talking about one specific thing. He's not talking about salvation only. He's talking about the grace that he received to be a minister of the gospel. The grace that he received to be spared his life when he was stoned. Uh, it's in every single way, in every moment of his life, no matter what's happening, whether we would consider it to be good or bad, Paul recognizes that it's only happening due to the grace of God. So sharing in God's grace with me here could be them uh, being able to spread the gospel together. The Philippians sending money to Paul so that he can preach the gospel. But Paul is in prison at this time, but he's still preaching and spreading the gospel, even in prison. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more 
in knowledge and depth of insight. So, so love can grow, uh, <clears throat> especially our love, the human love, because our love is imperfect. God's love is perfect, and I don't think God's love can grow because it's already perfect. Our love can grow because we can gain more knowledge and insight uh, and understanding of who God is and how we should live our lives and how we should continuously over and over sacrifice ourselves for the good of others. So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So here again is the day of Christ. Um, and I would say the same thing. Uh, it Traditionally, I've been taught that this would be the day of judgment when we meet Jesus, uh, which could be a specific day far off in the future in a timeless realm, or it could be the day that you actually die and meet Jesus on that day. Uh, but I really don't think that this day of the Christ would be specifically talking about 70 A.D., because it, uh, uh, it just doesn't seem to make it's it's a spiritual day. It's not a physical day of destruction, uh, which I do think that term can be used to describe a physical day of destruction. But I think this is talking about the hope that Christians have in Christ, the day that we realize, fully realize uh, our hope in Christ, where hope is no longer hope but we actually experience the full reward. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To okay, there again, the fruit of righteousness comes from Jesus. It comes through Jesus. Jesus supplies the all righteousness. If you ever do anything good, you cannot take credit for it yourself. You have to recognize where it comes from. You give God the credit for that. You praise God for His grace and His glory to work in you anything that is righteous. To the glory and praise of God. Not to the glory and praise of yourself. That is the result of when you have this concept that we have to do something in, er in order to earn God's favor. Even if it's the smallest thing that you can imagine, such as having faith. I don't. I think having faith is a big thing, but even if you consider faith to be a small thing, you cannot take credit for that. God is the one who deserves the praise and glory for every good thing. The fruit of righteousness, that would be faith. Include faith at least. And that comes from Jesus Christ. It's not in our own independent faith in who Jesus said he was, but it's in the work that God does in us to produce fruit of righteousness in us. And only if you recognize that God is the source of those things can you truly praise and glorify God for these things. Otherwise, you praise and glorify yourself for having faith or independent uh, righteousness apart from Jesus. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So he's in physical prison, but everybody knows why. He's in there because he preached the gospel. He's not in prison because he robbed anybody or committed a crime. He's there because he offended people by preaching the gospel. <clears throat> and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So, if Paul had n not boldly proclaimed the gospel in the hearing of the people that could throw him in prison, then other people would have been more timid to share the gospel if there's a possibility of being put in prison for it. But since Paul leads the way and demonstrates that it's not uh, the end of the world to be thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, 
and that the gospel does not stop just because you put in prison, that emboldens other people uh, to spread the gospel under all circumstances as well. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. I think this is a very important concept that people need to understand. Uh, because people seem to have this idea that they can judge the hearts of another person as to whether or why they are preaching the gospel. I do the same thing. Uh, I have a tendency to uh, not appreciate paid full-time preachers because I think they should get a job and work for their money and preach the gospel for free or be as little of a burden financial burden on that church as possible. I think that's what Paul did, and I think that's the principles that Paul taught, um, that we shouldn't be a burden to the church, but we should work with our own hands and provide for our own food and not expect the church to do it. Um, but we have to be very careful not to judge motives of other people. That's God's job. Jesus can do that perfectly without mistake, and we can't. We will make mistakes. Uh, the, the fact that we simply do it, I think, is a mistake, is a sin. Um, but Paul says he doesn't even care. He says, what does it matter? Even if someone does do it with a wrong motive, at least Christ is being proclaimed, and you have to at least recognize that. And God can work through even a sinner uh, or a person with a bad motive to accomplish uh, his will so maybe this person who's preaching for vain glory or riches actually converts a genuine heart or, or plays a role in converting a heart over to Christ and it's all worth it for the sake of the one who believes yes and I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now we'll see in a second that uh, Paul is absolutely confident that he will be delivered. But there are more than one way, there is more than one way to be delivered, either through life or through death. Uh, and he also talks about God's provision of the Spirit. So he, he, again, here is recognizing that the Spirit of God is at work in even these bad things that happen on earth or things that we perceive to be bad, such as being thrown in prison. Paul says that even him being thrown in prison uh, has been the work of the Spirit of God. God, it was God's will for him to be thrown in prison. It wasn't a, an opposition force to God that put him in prison. It wasn't Satan that put him in prison. Uh, it was God who had a will for him to, to deliver the message uh, in this way. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You see there, there's the deliverance that he is absolutely assured of, that he will, his life, his existence will not end, and that his uh, mission will not be in vain, because he knows that he that Christ will be exalted whether he lives or dies. If he lives, he will be a demonstration to other Christians to to preach the gospel under all circumstances and to not curse God even if you're arrested and thrown in prison. And if he dies, then uh, he will have the legacy that he's already accomplished on earth, and he will be in the presence of God and Jesus in heaven. So either way, he's delivered. 
for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now this grammar doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, <clears throat> for to live is Christ, is the part that I, I think what he's saying is, if I live, then I will live for Christ. I will live under his authority and under his subjection to him, and I will spread his message and preach his gospel. Uh, and to die is gain. And I think that's, you know, something people struggle with also. When a Christian dies, you're better off dead than alive. As long as you're living, you're living surrounded by sin and a cursed world, uh, surrounded by temptations and trials and hardship. Uh, but whenever you die, all that is removed and you're in the presence of of Christ in heaven and it's far better but we certainly can't hurry that process up uh, or commit suicide or die for the sake that we want to be in a better place because that could have an effect on it <laughs> on where you go or what happens it may not be better for you is what I'm trying to say because we have to learn how to submit ourselves to God's will and we should not take things in our own hands and say, this is what I want to do. The whole point of being a Christian is learning subjection and humility and saying, if I live, I'm going to live for Christ. And if I die, then whatever God's will is for me, uh, I'm fine with it. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. So here he talks about go on living in the body. I think he's talking about this physical flesh and bones, the uh, blood and flesh, flesh and blood that we walk around in. You have that on earth, but when you go to heaven, you don't have that. And there are people that teach that we will keep our bodies uh, in heaven or that our bodies will, will be, physical bodies will be resurrected from the graves. Because Jesus' physical body was resurrected from the tomb. Um, but I believe I mean, the, the transfiguration had already happened, which demonstrated his true nature. Because we will also be transfigured or changed uh, when we go to heaven. Because flesh and blood cannot enter heaven. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So Paul is talking here as if he has a choice. And uh, I don't really think he has a choice. He said, what shall I choose? Or, or what I think what he's saying, what do I want to do? Well, if someone said, well, what would you rather do? Would you rather die and live with Christ? Or would you rather live in this body and be stoned and thrown in prison, uh, and tempted and tried in every way. Well, by far, I would rather be with Christ in heaven, but I don't think he's saying I have a choice because you can't just decide to die and go live with Christ. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. See, he recognizes a the need to serve other people that as long as he's in the flesh and in this world uh, he can assist other people he can help other people come to a greater understanding of christ and humility and service and love but his selfish desire would be to abandon the human race and just go be in the presence of god Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So Paul says, I'm convinced that I'm not going to die in prison or wherever, that I'm not going to die now because I think God wants to use me to reach you. <clears throat> He's not saying that... Uh, that Paul has to accomplish more works uh, for his own justification. He's saying God will use him 
to help and assist them. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, I don't think worthy here means sinless or perfect. I think it just means um, you need to conduct yourself in, in such a way that you can demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit. The fact that God lives in you, that you're a Christian, that other people should be able to see that uh, and recognize your humility, your love, and your service toward other people. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a... So that's what faith is. Faith is not being afraid of opposition. Faith is trusting that God has power over all opposition and that God is working in you whatever he decides to work in you. Sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. For it has been granted to you. So it is a gift to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe, but to suffer. <laughs> That's two gifts that most people do not understand come from God. Suffering is a gift from God, and so is belief. If you believe in Him, then it was granted to you to believe in Him. God gave you the gift of belief. You can praise God for your faith. And if you suffer, you can praise God for your suffering. Not con curse Satan for bringing suffering to you. Satan is not the one that has power over these things. God is the one who has power over it. God is sovereign over all things, over the will of man, because God grants you uh, the ability to believe, and God also grants you the opportunity to suffer. You need to dwell on that a little while and not assume that God only does the things that you consider to be good and that God is does not interact or engage in the human mind since you are going through the same struggle you saw i had and now hear that i still have 